beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right-doing. There is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make sense. Hi everyone. I met Andre Carl through a mutual friend a few years ago and have run into him at various social occasions a few times since then. What always stood out for me about him was a certain sense of serenity that he has inside him. When I started thinking of people whom I could speak to for this podcast, he was one of the first people I could think of. I have always been intrigued about what it is that he has that give him such a calm aura. So, today is the day that we find out. I hope you get something out of it. Here goes. Andre. Yes, Fred. How are you doing? Very good. Thanks, man. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you so much for doing this. I it's realize only a that pleasure. everybody's so busy. Um, so, so for somebody to take an hour out of the day, I really appreciate it. You're Thank welcome. You. Truly. So, the first thought that comes to mind is name, surname, combination is very Afrikaans. Yes. But you're very English. Well, um, my, I'm, I'm, I'm Tuitala. Okay. My mom was English. And her mother was on the on the the British side. She was a child on the British. Her parents on the British side of the Boer War. Oh my word! And my father comes. He's Afrikaans. and comes from the Karoo, and his and his mother, his gra- my grandmother, was in an internment camp in a oh concentration camp under the British. So it just shows how quickly history can change. Eh? You had a clothing brand. We d- I did on, yes. Andre yes. Carl. Andre Carl clothing. <laughs> Huge. You must know this, but the day that Nelson Mandela was released, yes. I wore your shorts. To the parade. <laughs> I, I wasn't planning on being on the parade. Yes. <laughs> I was on Clifton Beach and I was actually in the army in, in those days. Yes. And I was doing selection for the Military Psychological Institute at Longabar. Mm-hmm. So I was living in the, in the officer's mess in Longabar yes. and went to the beach and not knowing Cape Town... It needed mm. to take a train back to Mollerton yes. and ended up on the station where okay. everything was, was happening. Yes, so got yes. caught in a riot where the car was shaken and everything. Yes. And all I thought was, oh my God, I look so camp in these trousers. <laughs> 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 so your brand is ingrained in my head as the day that Nelson Mandela was yeah. released, I wore your, your shorts. Those were lovely clothes. Yeah, what no, happened that, to that the brand? So what happened was the company became very big. We supplied chain stores and we were we were exporting. And then when after independence, South Africa became part of the global economy, and we the duties that governed the importation of clothing into South no. Africa was lifted, and we just couldn't compete. Okay. The interesting thing is that during apartheid, there was some protection for the for the garment workers union. The Garment Workers Union protected um, and fought very hard and they were very strong to protect the, the, the clothing worker workers. But now we are importing clothing from sweatshops in the East Absolutely. with much less protection, yeah. you know. Which so is actually compete, ironic, actually. Yeah, yeah, so we couldn't compete. Mm. So it's quite, it is, I, I always used to say, you must never say never, but I say I will never go back in the clothing industry and here I am. <laughs> I just want to say, we, we're sitting with a whole rack of t-shirts yes. hanging behind us. <laughs> but, but this is now more about, we, we buy the t-shirts in from, from Mauritius, they get, they get manufactured, they're very good quality. And then, so this is, we, the, they're just really canvases for design. So we spend our days now designing. I don't have a huge staff. I don't want to to get too big. I want to be able to travel a lot. I want freedom and I want it light. Yeah. I want to travel light. (laughs) Light through life. I like that. So you said father comes from the Karoo. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Stellenbosch. Okay. In in Banuk. Beautiful valley. But that was probably my most important formative years of my life, was during that time. Okay. So I went to Paul Rees Gymnasium, which is a dual medium school. Was it dual medium at that stage? Yeah, it was, yes. Okay. But I, I was in an English class, but most of our um, classes were in English and Afrikaans. Okay. Mostly probably more Afrikaans. Just 10%. the flack you must have received English a, from the Marama. From the Marama, what are yeah, you yeah, doing yeah, to yeah. me? No, no, that is, that is true. And also being... You know, knowing at that point in time that I was gay and having to hide that. Oh, my word. It was a very difficult time. And I actually decided one year to go to boarding school. 
and I went to my parents and they said, well, my parents had this philosophy that we have to make our own money. Okay. And so I started my first business, I think I was 16 or something. Oh, um, and so I had money. So I said, okay, I'll, go, I'll pay for myself. <laughs> and it wasn't expensive in those days. They eventually did pay. So what made you decide you want to go to boarding school? Well, it was, I had a hard time. My dad and I didn't see eye to eye. Okay. Um, I just, and I wanted to change, you know. And that change was a quintessential year of my life. I actually developed social skills instead of being sort of insecure, quiet, boys stay keeping out, keeping out of the limelight. Yeah. I was voted as head boy of the boarding school. I didn't oh, accept wow. it. I left again. I changed my mind two years later. <laughs> and then I, and I became a prefect, a, a um, student in Leelingrad in yeah. Boris. Now, Leelingrad and Boris is normally academic, sport, of which both of them I'm not very good at. No. Not? No, no, no. Uh, so you broke the mold, the whole Afrikaner yes. Bruderbond thing. You yes. came in and said... And I was an art student. <laughs> well, I, I, I didn't really use that position as, as as well as I probably could have. You know, I, was, I, was, I had a lot of friends and I was learning to jaw and, you know, and I was probably a useless student counsel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I still believe I'm the worst head boy our school ever had. Did you have, were you head boy? Yeah. Wow, for, wow, I, God knows why. It, uh, it, it okay. just, I don't know. But anyway, okay. listen, so... Did you grow up in Christic National? Did you? So my father was Dutch reform, okay, and my mom was Catholic. Okay, so you and definitely grow up with religion. Yeah, yeah, no, okay. very strong. We we went to church every Sunday, but my brother and I, my mom, one of the conditions of of her getting married to my father was that the children had to be Catholic. Okay, so we went to Catholic church, and I think that was really important. So my entire life. We went to church with people of all races okay. and there was never, you know, there was never a race issue. So that was something that bugged me a lot about the rest of South Africa from a very young age was the fact that, you know, that they could justify Christianity. <laughs> they could justify apartheid um, in the name of Christ. Yeah. Intelligent, high ranking people in the Dutch Reform Church and also in government. Yeah. And people bought into that. I, it just astounded me. So, so that was one thing that I had a problem with religion, was how it could be manipulated. And, and, and the, the people that I saw as, as Christians were not, in my opinion, what I sort of understand a Christianity to be, you know, love thy neighbor, you know, give the other cheek, etc. Et yeah. So, um, and love thy enemy and, you know, forgive and, and so on. So, so that was my, my biggest problem, and I was, and I realized from a very young age that I was gay. So, so and and in in the Dutch Reform Church, the, the school, the Catholic Church, all my friends, I think even medicine at the time, really believed it was an aversion, yeah. you know, and the churches and the schools, you know, you in the in the in the reborn Christian side of. Of of, Christ, of 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 religion, believe that you were demon possessed and yeah. that you were, and that would really. And I read a lot of books. I, now, I I, th I I can never stress this enough. You know, we it, when you look at history or things in in re in retrospect, it's very difficult to to understand the depth of fear, and also the nuances. Yes. For instance. Can you imagine a child going through puberty? And this is still happening today. And it's, I mean, um, the gay rights, we live in a bubble in Cape Town. But I mean, if you look at the rest of the world and Russia, East Absolutely, Europe, yeah. um, Middle East, etc., Africa. When we, when, when, when I grew up, I believed I was going to hell. But at the same time, I was bubbling or inside me were bubbling up all these sexual feelings and probably never stronger than then was, you know, when you when you're going through puberty, Absolutely. you're so horny. And and you and, and I just that's what it was, you know, I was I was um I had this conflict in my life. And I was handling it this is the other important thing, I was handling it completely on my own. Yeah. 
you know, I was I was too scared to speak to a teacher. I was too scared to speak to, um, obviously, a doctor or my parents or the church Never or whatever. Parents. Yeah. Been, my parents would have been the last people that I would have spoken to. So, oh, so, fifty-seven, okay. just turned fifty-seven for the January. So um, it's very, it's, it's, uh, this was the 70s, you know. That's why I wrote Morphe. Yeah. Because I wanted to, to try my best to describe to people how it feels to be on the other side of the fence and to feel how, it, how you know, what persecution really feels like. I actually, I was once invited to meet the deputy president and she was amazing. She was, we were at tea for about an hour and we chatted. And I said to you, try and imagine the prejudice that we felt. Yes, we could go to all the beaches, we sit on the white benches and stuff like that. But can you imagine the prejudice where, you, where you're not part of a group, where there's no affirmation from t- television or Ugh. friends, or there's no one, no role models, there's no... You're, I feel you're, anxious just you're, you're talking scared about your parents are going to find out, you're scared mm-hmm. your friends are going to find out, you're scared... That's why the word Morphe was the word that I yeah. feared the most, you know. But then I, w- I went through this searching process. I thought, okay, well, you know, remember that my entire background then was religion, you know, my f- strong Christian yeah. faith. Those so days can I we. Quickly yeah. interrupt you there. So while you and your brother and mom went to the Catholic church, the da- dad engaged in the Afrikaans church? Or? Yes. Okay. Yes. So Same from both day, sides, so. The, the religion was yes. present. Yes, okay. yes, yes. You know, in those days, we had, you know, hall in the, in, on Fridays and Mondays, and there was, it was always open with, with religion. There was religious studies, but it wasn't really religious studies. It was Christian studies. Absolutely. People, if you didn't believe in God, or ra- rather in a religion, you were ostracized. You know, you were, this was really a serious thing. Um, Did you know of anybody who openly declared that it didn't believe in God? There was maybe one or two people at school, but they were the, like really oddballs. Yeah. I, I realize now they were probably, you know, very... Um, enlightened. You know, enlightened. <laughs> yeah. Well, very brave. Yeah. You know, they thought things through and, and obviously often maybe thought about things that we, everybody else had thought about. Yeah. But we're just too scared to actually formulate the thought. But I did, um, I, I think it was in Senate 7 or Senate 8, I can't remember, I became um, a reborn Christian in a, in a Christian Union camp. So um, th- we used to go around these Christian Union camps and there was sort of, not pressure, but there were people that if you wanted to talk to them, you, were, you could talk to them. And, and I never revealed my homosexuality, but I, but I wanted to be cured because I believed that I was demon-possessed. <laughs> so I was re- reading... I didn't say, look, cure me. I thought that if I become a reborn Christian, I would be cured. Yeah. And um, it, it, it actually, it, it's, it opened up a vast amount of questions in the my being mind. Reborn. Be, being reborn. Being reborn and Christianity and so on. Okay. But my biggest concern at the time was, was I'm becoming a Christian because I was... That was my, my what I was had that, that I've been exposed to. If I was exposed to, to to Islam, I would become a Muslim. If it was a Buddhism, I would become a Buddhist, yeah. etc. So it bu- it bugged me a lot that this choice was basically circumstantial in a way. Okay. Like Christians would tell you a lot of other things. They say you're chosen and I'll let it good. But um, I, I, and it also bothered me because Christianity believes that if you're not a Christian, you're not a reborn Christian, you, you're not going, you're going to hell. Yeah. And that did not make sense to me. So there was a lot of, there was, I can go on and on about the number of things that bothered me and didn't make sense to me. But I did one, I had these three mentors at school. That's where you were. And um, the, the, the one mentor was a librarian, a woman called um, um, Annie de Toy. She was sort of an eccentric woman, but I loved her. She was she was wise and and um, very, very religious, but but just she just had a wonderful way of seeing life, and she was very, she was just just like there was a connection. Mm. And but um, so Mr. Toy one night at I, it was in Cedarburg, and. Um, we, it was also sort of a camp. We were hiking there, but she went with to help with the food and stuff. And I spoke to her and I said to her, 
why I'm a Christian because I'm in a Christian environment and because I was a Christian background. I'm not convinced that I would not have be I would have chosen Christianity without any knowing anything about Christianity because at that point in time I knew nothing about Buddhism or yeah. Islam or anything. So what would have been the chances? And why would you so so I'm not really this is something that's bugging me. And she said something which had a really big impact on my entire life. She said, Well, why don't you ask God? So I thought to myself, well, you know, if I'm going to, if I'm not believing God so strongly in all of it, you know, does it, that make sense? You know, yeah. listening, not listening to all the fear mongering about going to hell and not going being saved, all the other people burning in hell and so on. You know, this is a very honest, gentle, concerned, young Christian asking God the Father. Yeah. And I believe that God said to me, because I did, I sort of I prayed in, about it a lot. God said to me, whatever you're comfortable with, you know. Okay. I realized then that my Christianity was religious based. And, and I wanted to free myself from that because there was a lot of things about religion I wasn't accepting. Okay. You know, the apartheid, the the uh, Catholicism and, and all, with all its sins <laughs> yeah. and controls and f money and rules. And then also I was starting to read about the history of the Bible and how it was written and, and, and how it was, you know, and the contradictions and, and a lot of laws yeah. which made no sense to me. And, and in any case, it was a lot of things. But in the Christian Union period, the, the, the reborn Christian period, I became very acutely aware of a spiritual component to the to the planet, to the to the to the cosmos, to okay. the world, to the universe, and that, that that I could have a communication with this force, wherever he, she, it may be to everybody. This this was my formula. This is the way I was thinking, you know, when I was 18, 19 years old, and I was and I thought, well, if I, Every single person that I have a, a relationship, a friendship relationship with, is unique. How much more unique is not your relationship with um, this force of whether it's energy or whatever? And 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 I and I read a lot about it and and, and so on. And then I went to the army, and that was very hard. And and I, I came out and I, and I was you know broke and I started my business on the car clothing well actually first devastation and then on the car clothing and now and I built that up but I had a, a a a sort of a quiet time where I could just internalize my thoughts and be communicate my feelings with God but it was. It became a. It became sort of routine and became, um, you know, uh, it, it just the sort of guilt-driven, and which is what religion a lot is, and so on. So, th th then I I went. I did a, a meditation course. Okay. This is probably early late thirties. Okay. You know, so that was a long period. So it was of, a long period. Of yes. Did you of, read of, of, a lot? Did you? I, I didn't. I, I used to read a lot about religion, but it, but for me, you see, I was saying to myself, well, if I'm whatever I'm reading is once again somebody's opinion. They can okay. based on science. It can based on, but if we can develop a relationship with God, then, then let's leave the this this three dimensional tactile world alone. Okay. And let's develop this spiritual side. Okay. Kind of let's see what's there for me, because you said earlier, if, if all of us are so unique, how unique yes. came my relationship with that God? That, that's so right. You went yes. In search of that unique that, that's right. that, that works that's right. for you in, in this. So I realized that praying in inverted commas was I couldn't really still my mind. I was drifting off, and I was so it became formula. And in meditation, what it teaches you is to to focus your mind. Yes. 
Now, it, it, strictly speaking for meditation, it's really just to center yourself and to still your mind. But I realized that when I got to that, and it, and it doesn't often happen, uh, <laughs> that I get to this absolute point where it's absolutely focused. Yeah. And it's absolutely pure absolute, and, and, and there's nothing else. That, that's when sort of the magic happens yeah. spiritually. And that has really seen me through my life because I've pretty much had to look after myself all my life. I, you know, I can't go to call my father and say, listen, I need a bailout or yeah. I've never, you know, I can't ask him to help me with my business or what. it was just not our relationship was, was never like that. I, I, I must say I do like meditation in a spiritual space, like in a in a big cathedral. I love going into a b- beautiful cathedral. Mm. Or there's there's definitely a. Oh, well, I've just been to, to to Ecuador, and you see those churches that are extraordinary. When the human being tries their absolute absolute ultimate to design and paint and create space for worship there's something really powerful about yeah. it i think it's extraordinary yeah so that's pretty much where i am spiritually and and uh, and i and i think that people must be be weary of listening to the present world systems thought process on spirituality or religion or whatever what they are exposed to opposed to their own personal relationship with that dimension. Yeah. And that dimension, I really believe, can be a personal journey and, and grow. Absolutely. So, at what stage did you come out of the closet? So, uh, after the army... So, you went into the army with this what we called in the army in those days, geslacht rol, identificatie problem, gender role, <laughs> yeah. identification problems. Yes, I read your role. Your yeah. role, role like. yes. Well, when I was in, in, in Banuk, going through puberty, you know, everybody's going through that sort of discovery stage and I played a lot with the, my friends. Yeah. And, as, uh, as one, as one as does. As one does. That, that, yes. That's the, that phase, yeah. That's the phase. I realized that it was more and I realized that that for them it was not. Did you, did you know and understand the concept of homosexuality? Absolutely. Did you know what it Absolutely. was? Absolutely. Are you serious? Absolutely. I didn't know at all. I A lot of people something didn't. Something was wrong. Yeah. Something, something yeah. was not right. Yeah. See, but I didn't know. I think, look, my parents made it very clear that two men kissing each other, um, you know, two men... I didn't know there was a lot of So you, you were spoken to about these yes, things? Yes, yes. See, I always say that Two things my parents never warned me about. Men and drugs. And look at me now. <laughs> so something, something went wrong very seriously. You, know, you, you should have been very specific about where I was not supposed to go. Yes. <laughs> so you were, so they would speak to me. They, so they would were speak to us. About but no, they're not, it wouldn't be a sit-down conversation, but there yeah. would be a lot of comments. And in the school, and in, you know, scripture readings and whatever. So you Guilt, because I, I do hear guilt. In, in no, it was definitely where I felt guilt. So, so that so, uh, guilt was based in religion. Because yes, that's based in religion, off. without a doubt. Um, so at what stage, okay, back to coming out to your parents. Mm-hmm. How old were you when you kind of, mom, uh, dad? Oh, okay, so my parents, so after the army, in the army I had a um, gay sex. Okay. But then it was very dangerous because if you were caught, you could go to War 22. Yeah. And when I and when I came out of, of the army, sorry, I first studied art for three years, but I started a business at the same time at night. I decided, fuck this, I'm gay, you know, this is who I am. Yeah. And and I was in this, this free environment in art school, and I, I basically left home because I was starting to make money, and I got a flat at, in town, and I and yeah, in, my, Cape my, town. in Cape Town. Did you study in Cape Town as well? Yeah, studied in Cape okay. Town. So and I had a boyfriend. My parents never came to that apartment. They never. They they ba- they they basically said to me, "If you are gay, let me use the word gay, homosexual, um, homo, we don't want to know about it." 
So I thought, okay, cool. Okay. So you not, we don't I want didn't to know say, about you. No, we don't know no. about it. Yeah, if you are. Okay. Then you. Then you. <laughs> okay. And then, I, you know, as I said, I didn't see my parents that often. I, I would go and visit them with my boyfriend. And, you, you know, I, I thought if they ever, they, would, they never did. But if they ever asked me, I'll tell them. Yeah. Because I was living quite openly gay. Mm. I mean, I wouldn't kiss my boyfriend in, or hold his hand in front yeah. of them or something like that. Something like that. I mean, we must remember this with the early 80s. And then one day my father phoned and he said, we're having a family dinner and would you want to come on Thursday? And I said, well, I'm going to bring Grant. So my father said, well, he's not family. Ah. So I said, well, is Nelia coming, which is my brother's w- girlfriend at the time? So he said, yes. Ah. So I said, well... I'm sorry, but he's my boyfriend. So if he's not, fa- if, if Nelia can come and he can't come, then I'm not coming. No offense, no hard feelings. You made your point, but I also yeah. have my point. And my dad was very big about it. He, he phoned me back. He, he said, okay, fine. And then he phoned me back and he said, no, that's not what I want, you know? And at that point in time, my mom was working for me. And so this is my father and I had this conversation on the phone. It was very... Amicable. We, we never really discussed it again. In, uh, only after Morphe was released, okay. I went oh, okay. with Grant, with okay. my boyfriend. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, I just the, the he was big enough to say, bring him. Okay. I did. I don't want us. I, I'd rather have you as my son with your my, your boyfriend than not have you at all. So um, then I told my mom. Called my mom into my office and we sat down and said, Mom, I have to tell you something. I'm, I'm homosexual. And she said, um, to sat and she says, Does that mean you can't go to the Catholic Church? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, Well, I can go. I can go. But the Catholic Church doesn't really want me yeah. at that point in time. But you weren't going to well, church then anyway. I wasn't really going to church. Okay. No, no. I see a lot of you being in nature. Yes. You, 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 so you're a biker and you travel to but I, by obscure biking, destinations. Yes, yes. I've just crossed the Andes on a motorbike. Oh, good. Into the Amazon. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Three weeks ago. And that is part of your... Am My I right passion. if I say that's part of your spirituality for you? That Okay. I, I, I love being in nature. I think nature is just a flippant miracle. Yeah. It's just absolutely beautiful. I always think of you as nature. Really, <laughs> for 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 me in my head, yeah. when I when when I see you, I see you in nature, nowhere else. Yes, it's weird to yes. see you in an office. Yeah, <laughs> really, yeah. really it's yeah. kind of you don't. But I'm golf food. <laughs> but you see, you you I mean, you see, uh, I've got this old Land Rover, yeah. which is twenty three years old. Oh my word! And that and and uh, I mean, I go. There's the blessing about living where we are. we live. You know, Namibia, Botswana, oh. Zambia. Mozambique, all these places are close by, and, and there are really truly wilderness areas still there. Yes. Um, like, like the Kuka felt in the northern part of um, Namibia is just a mind blowing experience. And so, for me to be out in nature is, is a, it, it, it's just amazing. It's just, it's just sort of really does feed my soul. The, I've never been to the Amazon before until this time. What was extraordinary it was just walking into those jungles and being feeling. Being, submerging yourself in everything that is so alive, being so aware that below your feet, for kilometers in either direction, there is just life. Yeah. Billions of species and just such an extraordinary experience. And, and, but I feel that also in, 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 um, in, the, in the desert. We, we crossed the desert once on, on horseback. Oh, for wow. five days um, in the Namib. Good grief. The, the Namib Desert, up to Swakop and rode the horses into the sea. It was, it was extraordinary. Good and grief. we, and at night, you know, we'd be so tired from riding all day and we'd just walk with our bedrolls. We had bedrolls, it was in winter, and with sheepskin liners and this, it was incredible. And we'd lie and lie under the stars and it was a new moon, so there was no moon. Oh, no. Wow. So there was just this canopy of, of stars. And I have a passion for the stars because that's really one of the things that we are in touch with that gives us true perspective. If we start considering 
the distances of those lights <laughs> and how vulnerable totally we are. Yeah. Now, now, something else that's important is like, for instance, how, you know, we're very blessed to live in Cape Town. Now, if you consider in our solar system, the, 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 most, the highest temperature will be the center of the sun, just our solar system, that our star with its planets going around it. And the coldest will be sort of interplanetary space, yeah. minus I don't know how many degrees. Now, if you consider we as human beings can only, even on our planet, we can't really cope with minus without help. Yeah. You know, even probably 10 degrees, you start, you know, things are starting to get really uncomfortable. And, and if we start going over 30 degrees, things start getting yeah. unco uncomfortable. We need some protection. But, but, you know, here we're sitting in T-shirt and shorts, bare feet, and in a pinprick of perfection, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, and the, the, the planet, you know, it's called Goldilocks planet because it is so perfectly positioned. Yeah. So, so to be in nature, I mean, th these things, and you can look at the smallest leaf and whatever, it's, it's, just, it's just magnificent, yeah. you know. You so take I do the like most nature. amazing photographs as well. Did you do a pausing photography? No, at any I don't. I don't think I take those such I good photographs. I think you take wonderful <laughs> photographs. Look, I used to have an old Pentax with film, and I know, I know, because you know, then you set the photograph up and you think mm. of the light and you think of the aperture and the f stops and I mean the f stops. Sorry, the, the and the. And you, you know, because you, you don't have digital where you can just go. Yeah. <laughs> you get basically and one so shot. I, I think those photographs were, in those days were probably a little bit better. Um, now, I mean, I love using, just using my iPhone. I think it's just fantastic that I've got it with me mm. and so on. But I take less and less photographs on, of trips. You know, I did take of, of the Amazon, a, a few of the Amazon and crossing the Andes. But riding a motorbike, you, you, it, you've got this 360 degree view yeah you know it's not through a section of a window and you're feeling the wind and your smells and everything just stop and take your gloves off and find your phone and then <laughs> take your helmet off and mm -hmm. you just you rather just experience it yeah. and that is a, is a is a is important for me i'll never forget at some stage my ex and i bought a an old chev four by four crappy little Thing without a roof and whatever and the first morning I drove to work with, mm. with this thing I was on the Val Drive mm. that is next to Table Mountain you virtually drive on the foot of Table Mountain for the people who don't know and I thought what is that smell this smells weird and I realized this is mm. this is the mountain this is what it mm. smells like yes and it was such a weird feeling to realize this is what I miss being mm. in my car with the, with yes. the air conditioner Yes. It was such a weird thing. And all the so filters can, and everything. Yeah. yeah. So I can yeah. imagine yeah. being on a yeah. bike, how yeah. absolutely... You feel the wind and, and you're also concentrating the whole time. Yeah. You know, in the car you get bored because you're sitting and you're yeah. on the steering wheel. And do you find that... <laughs> I love jogging. Okay, this this mm. is coming a wrong way, a long way. But mm. I, I love jogging. But due to being a hurdly in my young age i've got knee problems and ankle problems mm. and god knows mm. what so for stages i can jog nicely and then my knees conk in and then i need mm. to rest for a long time until the knees are okay and then i possibly need an op but i'm too afraid to go for that mm. so i just rest until the knees are okay then i start yes. again so at some stage i said to my my husband i want to cycle now and we fixed mm. his bicycle and i went through four three or four cycles number one it made me far more tired than jogging did I think and it was just I probably was, different exercise. Yes, you but know. I was paranoid. And I thought to myself, oh. but as a teenager, you cycled yes, everywhere. Yes. But as a 50-year-old, yeah. you know, you, you don't have the arrogance of youth anymore. That's but I was right. so nervous. And yeah. it suddenly dawned on me how careful one must be on a motorbike. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I've just always had this, th this philosophy to live life to the fullest, to embrace every single moment, and rather than to live a safe, long, boring life. Yeah. Now, I'm not <laughs> saying that, that I made the right choice, but that's for me. Mm. That works for me. So, we are all going to die. And um, I just hope it's, it's gentle and quick, mm. and not long and <laughs> drawn yeah. out. You know what I mean? I um, always used to say, live fast, die young, have a beautiful corpse. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't die young. So. <laughs> yeah. so I'm 50, I'm 57, so <laughs> yeah, clearly it's, it's, it's worked so long. I know, and I mean, you know, we've... 
I experienced some very, very dangerous situations. I mean, on the border it was dangerous. I, I, I ended up in a wall once going gorilla trekking in, Z- in Zahir. Oh it was God. in Zahir. You know, crossing the, the I've done a number of horseback safaris. That, that, that's being on a horse in Africa, mm. swimming them through the Delta waters in the Okavango Delta. Um, you know, the, you know, there's no, there's no cell phone reception. Yeah. There's, um, you know, those type of things. You know, um, probably driving my car, which doesn't have airbags and things, is also probably dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> but life is. In terms of spirituality, where do you see your? This is going to be a weird question. I hope it makes any sense. Your mortality. Well, the truth is, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I'm not. I, I, I don't believe in. I, I. The reincarnation doesn't resonate with me. I can't say it's it, it's a possibility or not. We just don't know. I believe that touching gently in everything that I do. So everybody, the car guard, the big issue salesperson, the, mm. the, the people above you, below you, next to you, whatever, to just touch everybody and the planet as well. Yeah. As, as best we possibly can in this in, um, capitalist sort of consumerist <laughs> society we live in. But, but that I think, the, and I believe that that's very important because if we just touch gently everybody that we came into contact with, that would spread, you know. Yeah. You know, you'd have very definite, if, if, if governments and, and, and people were, and champions of business um, were concerned about the people and education and children, and mm. we would be, I think that would be yeah. very human. Um, or rather, or I would love humans to be. I don't believe I'm doing that, or I have this philosophy because I think it's going to get me to heaven. I don't know. Okay. I honestly don't know. And I nobody like really does st- know. That, that's what I want to say now. I yeah. like the way you started your answer with we, saying yeah. nobody knows. Yes. <laughs> and anybody who says they do, yes. then they're talking bullshit. You know? Well, I'd like <laughs> them to tell me how they know, you know. Yeah. Now, now, religion is based on faith, but the faith is based on writings that we're not a hundred percent sure of. Now, I, I've always considered myself if if I was God, and and I'm not a particularly good human being, and God's meant to be this really magnificent, yeah. the ultimate, ultimate um, forgiving yeah. God. There's a lot of things that God seems to be allowing that I would never allow. Um, <laughs> and um, the idea of not being chosen to be born, some people believe you do choose. Let's say we not. I, I can't remember being choosing. Yeah. I, I get thrust onto this planet. I get implanted with desires and lusts and traits and then there's these people telling me but if I if I if I am honest to these desires yeah. I'm going to hell forever burning damnation yeah. forever I, I, I just doesn't that does not resonate with me so right now to end off with what do you believe in um I believe that we must touch gently. I love that. I really, really like that. It's such a beautiful way of saying it. I believe that in this completely idealistic philosophy, look, um, I'm going to take a bit of time to answer your question. Cool, good. And this is something that I feel very, very strongly about. But the world is in dire straits. There are too many people on this planet and we're polluting it at a rate which is unfathomable. This is driven by selfishness and greed. And what interests me is that people who, there are people who are driving this, who have got children. Are they not thinking about their children or do they just think that their wealth can protect them? 
Now, now, how do we solve this problem? Because in this greed-driven society we live in, 50% of all the wealth in the world belongs to 1% of the population, and the rest have the rest. Yeah. And that's also very skewed. The, the really poor people, I don't know what percentage they really own of that 50%, but very little, and that's yeah. the majority. And they're getting poorer, and the rich are getting richer. So I think to myself, how do we solve this? You know, because the poor people are having children who are probably too many which they can't afford and are not educated. And uh, you can't expect an non -edu uneducated person to, to be concerned about... To make an intric um, educated decision. You know, recycling yeah. or the... Or the uh, ice caps melting when they don't know where the next meal is going to come yeah. from. And and so the cycle just persists and it just snowballs, which is how we've seen this now over many generations. So so I believe, this is going to sound extremely um, like a fantasy, but I, on, I had to think of how can this be, how can this be solved? Mm. I mean, surely people must be thinking, how can this be solved? And I believe the only way to solve this is if the the leaders of the of the world have besides spending money on arms and ammunition and it's scary i i, I read a statistic once and I, I i don't like quoting statistics because i don't know if, if the, how accurate they are or if, if i'm quoting them correctly yeah. but something like eight days of of military spending of the entire planet which is enormous can feed like how many generations of children or oh my god generations so, uh, not, not like, like, like oh how many years yeah. I think sorry maybe not generations so that's maybe not wrong see I'm getting this wrong <laughs> maybe um, 10 years yeah. but whatever it is but, but, but surely we should be about, yeah. really and thousands of children die per year of hunger of hunger and yet 50% of the world produ food produced in the world gets trashed now yeah. I mean oh. if you think of this as this is, it's so skewed. It makes no sense. So the, how do we on. solve this? So let's say all the world's um, leaders have one objective, to feed and educate one generation of children. So that those, edu those children, an education that's geared towards um, sustainability opposed to consumerism. Yeah. And those kids at 16 years old are empowered to make dis decisions about the future, a very tough future which is waiting for them. Mm. And in this uh, on this overpopulated planet to look take care of all this of the the people and maybe have two children or one child instead of four or five or six yeah. so that's my idealistic um solution which clearly will ne nobody's going to listen to <laughs> <laughs> um but 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 I, but i believe that is a, that's possible yeah and my very first time at africa burn i did that that was my sculpture i wrote it as a sentence over like I don't know, half a kilometer or something, oh, and burned, word. burned the, the words. So what I believe in, I believe to touch gently, I believe that one must be happy. And I think happiness is a very deeply, uh, it's something that we have to discover that the core of happiness in our, in our spirit, very, we must think it through and discover it very carefully. Because, our initial thing is, oh, I'll be happy if I would get a Range Rover or if I become a multimillionaire or whatever. But if you really focus and really discover what is really genuinely important and makes you happy, I think that's important. I, I think it is very important to be happy yeah. because we don't know how long this time is going to be and um, it, it might as well be worthwhile. Absolutely. You know? So things that are... That make you happier would would be a contributing, changing things, having a being for me touching gently, being kind to myself as well. Ah. And um, I think that developing this personal relationship with my spiritual the spiritual component to the to the universe and my communication and link to it is is important awesome i love it last question mm. back to happiness yes <laughs> are you happy yes i think i am i i i'm i am yeah that's fantastic yeah there's definitely nothing that i want 
you know, I'm healthy, which is, and I'm, and I'm, and part of the discipline of, of my um, uh, meditation in the mornings is gratitude. Is, is because you see, we, we focus, you, you, you hurt your elbow, and that's all you think about, the pain, ah, you know? Absolutely. And you think, but if my elbow was right, I'd be happy. But in fact, I can <laughs> breathe, and I'm yes. fit, and I've got food, and I've got shelter, and I've got, a, a, you know, a, 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 got the ability to travel and I've got knowledge and I've got a good education and I, I'm creative and I've got a business I yeah. absolutely love I mean whether it's Sunday or Monday to me makes no difference I love being here yeah. I live in Cape Town I can go walk in the promenade <laughs> now and look exactly, at the, yeah. you know uh, the moon rise well the moon's going to rise later this tonight because it's starting but um, watch the sunset yeah yeah I, that's I'm, fantastic I'm happy I love what you said about your elbow. I wrote, I'm busy writing a book at the moment, and part of what mm. I wrote there was that thought process of, because I have a headache, I'm having a shit mm. day. And mm. that's not true. Mm. <laughs> yeah. My day is going fine, yes. but I've got a headache. Yes. <laughs> it's a completely it, it, different it, it, way of, way yes, of look, yes. looking at it, isn't it? And also the thing is like with headaches and pain and things like that, I mean, the, 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 I'm, I'm not there, but maybe to a very tiny degree but when we can we can decide how much of this pain are we allowing to affect us yeah. you know is to, is to take it out and put it down there and walk around it and say okay you know you are you you're you're you you there yeah but you don't have to be here in yeah. my thought process I think that uh, um, we can also choose happiness we can choose to be sad we can choose to be happy yeah I think that's extremely important. Andre, thank you so very much. Ah, oh, I thoroughly enjoyed talking to Andre Carl. We met and had this chat in his office. It is such an inspiring space. The whole place is cluttered with pictures, symbols and other creative stuff that I cannot even find words for. The whole environment shouts creativity and I felt a surge of creative energy flowing through me. His current business is to design t-shirts, hence my reference to us being surrounded by t-shirts. For those of you who do not know yet, Andre Carl is a writer of the well-known novel called Moffy, which is a derogatory term for a gay man in Afrikaans. I've read the book twice and appreciated the finer nuances more the second time I read it. I think it is a recommended read as it represents a snapshot of a significant part of South African history. It has also been adapted into a dance production for theatre, and I have heard unconfirmed rumours that there is a movie deal on the go. I forgot to ask Andre Carl about it. Sorry. I love, love, love how he says that we need to touch gently. That is so indicative of how I see him and what he portrays. After our chat, I feel inspired to be out in nature more and to show it the respect that it deserves. I wish him a long and happy path on this journey of life. If you have any feedback or remarks, please feel free to pop me an email or connect with me on social media. It will be great to hear from you. If you want to know more about what I do, please feel free to connect with me on my website, which is www.freddy.org.za or find me on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash freddy.org.za forward slash or on Twitter at at Rensburg Freddy. Remember that Freddy is always spelled with an IE at the end. Be safe. Bye.